Welcome readers, listeners, and viewers from across America and around the world. This is Zen Garcia. I'm your host. This is FallenAngels.tv. It's Saturday, July 17th, 2010. It's 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and uh, we are streaming out of Athens, Georgia. And I'm honored to have as guest with me today, Barry Shamish. And he's going to be covering one of his books. He's a very prolific author and writer and journalist and has several books out, um, specifically on Israel and politics surrounding um, has written a book about the murder of Yitzhak Rabin, and but today we're going to be talking about the giants and the return to the Holy Land. Um, in an article, Barry Seamus wrote, uh, "Are the Anakim or the Rephaim, the giants of the Bible, returning to Israel today? There are only two periods of recorded history when giants were reported in Israel: in biblical days from the time of the flood." to the ascension of King David and since 1993 in modern Israel. The case for the return of the giants to Israel is strong. In fact, what characterizes the current Israeli UFO wave from others in the world is the sheer abundance of physical evidence left behind by the visitors. Consider the first incident to usher Israel into the UFO age. And Barry's going to be talking about this very important story, um, and we're going to give him a platform to bring it out the way that he would like. I'm going to ask uh, the listening audience to refrain from calling in till he sets the foundation for this story. Uh, and then when we feel it's appropriate, we will accept calls, and you're welcome to um, get your queries answered then. But, Barry, can you say hello to the listening audience, and thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I guess we'll get started. I, I'm going to start um, before the incident. The wave uh, that hit Israel was from 1987 to 1999. Uh, uh, the last major UFO sighting that was recorded on videotape um, was... Uh, Professor Shkalim, um, uh, let's see, I think he, I think he was Bari Land University. Nonetheless, he caught the last UFO in July of 1999, and then the wave, uh, partly uh, the wave ended because uh, there was an absolute media battle to put an end to it. There were so many Israelis who had... Uh, seen, filmed, or witnessed uh, these UFOs uh, that literally every single week there was a front page story um, uh, with documentation, and this has been going on for years. Now, partly for whatever reasons uh, the authorities wanted this ended. That That's the first thing. And secondly, they did stop. Uh, I had a good network um, of contacts, and from the year 2000 and on, uh, they just dried up. There was nothing much happening again. So we, we begin just with an itty-bitty bit of background, uh, why I jumped into this story to begin with. Um, f from 1979 to 1981, I served in the Israeli Air Force. Um, I shot missiles, and in the summer of 1980, there was a wave worldwide, I found out, uh, but just a wave of sightings of satellite-like, uh, well, craft, lights, but they could turn on a dime. I'm talking about 90-degree turns. Uh, without blinking an eye, they were defying our physics, and they were spotted worldwide. But Israel, um, again, uh, well, I was in Israel with, at the height of, of this wave, and we had the best equipment. Uh, we were trained to spot anything in the sky. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, a unit. Uh, well, of anti-aircraft missile operators, 
uh, who knew what was supposed to be in the sky. And, well, when these things started nightly appearing, uh, and everyone saw them. Uh, now, dissension isn't the word uh, that happened in my, in my unit. Now, I led, uh, well, I had friends as well, but I pretty well led uh, the view that this was uh, something like, well, outside of outside of human uh, capabilities and uh, or UFOs. Uh, the, the other side was this a weapon. We're, we're testing a, a tremendous weapon, and again, human physics uh, didn't allow us to build a weapon that could defy gravity and do a, um, a 90 degree turn. I'm telling you, these were in squadrons of, of three to five to seven, and they would break off. And they broke off at 90 degrees. In short, I said, no way humans have, uh, from Israel or anyone have come up with a way of defining G-forces and, and automatically turning at 90 degrees. And so I led that group, and we were really fighting. And finally, uh, a group of us went to our officers, and we requested that somebody tell us what on earth we're seeing at night. Uh, you know, we were pretty spooked already. And again, we had the best binoculars, and then, uh, we were just seeing them. We were seeing them pretty close. Well, one morning... We were roused and told to get into our civilian uniforms. Uh, we weren't sure why, and then we stood in threes, and our officers introduced us to, let's see, he had three. He was, a, I would say, a major uh, from, of all places, a meteorological division. I never understood that. But we stood at attention, then stood down, and he was introduced uh, and he said to us, we understand you've been seeing things in the sky. And we all nodded. And he said, he continues, if you tell anybody you're going to trial, we don't want you spreading panic. And that was the end of the meeting. And that was it. Back at attention, meeting is over. This piqued my curiosity um, and I continued uh, to investigate why we were threatened uh, with trial if we opened our mouths about this thing. And in the air, we got lectures all the time from pilots who would tell us what to hit, what to aim for, uh, what the characteristics of MiGs were. And, well, I would stay behind in the uniform, of course, and I would speak to the pilots. And, you know, when you've got two members of the Air Force, even though uh, theirs is a more skilled profession by far, they still talk to you. And I would go up to them and I, I would say, uh, uh, have you ever be, been scrambled to chase a UFO? And they all were scrambled to chase. I think there were three of them. One chased one over Jerusalem, another chased one over Haifa, and they had the basic stories. We got close, and then they took off and disappeared. But the pilots were all chasing UFOs. And this is from, this is from inside a major Israeli Air Force base. And, well, that prepared me for when the wave started. Um, I had enough experience to know that there were things in the sky and the Air Force was hushing us up and their pilots were chasing UFOs. This I got from personal experience. Uh, so in 87, I was out of the Air Force by a few years and the wave started. Oh, I hear music. Oh, uh, no, that's my cell phone. I apologize. Keep going, please. Oh, uh, right. All right, then let's start the 87 wave, which was a heck of a, a start. Now, it begins with a car mechanic. His name is Ami Akrayi. He's driving home September 28, 1987, the night before Yom Kippur, 
uh, the most serious holiday in the Jewish calendar. And he's on the coastal highway, if you know the place, just south of Haifa. And he sees, he's not sure what he sees. He sees a banana-shaped uh, red, what can you do when you can't describe a banana-shaped red object uh, seemingly in trouble. So he stops the car, and he gets out, and he sees this object. Well, he described it as a helicopter in distress, or he wasn't sure what he was seeing, but he watched it for 15 seconds. There was a tremendous flash of light on the beach below, and that beach is called Shikmona Beach. And then it was gone. Without going into other details, after the holiday was over, he went to the police, and he reported what he had seen. And the police, back in 87, there was only one Israeli ufologist, and I guess her phone number was in every police department, no idea, but they they arranged a meeting between Ami and Hadassah Arbel. She was... Hello? Yes, please continue. Right, that was a noise of some kind. She was the uh, ufologist for Israel. Now they go to Shikmona Beach, and, well, what they find is absolutely astounding. It's one of the great uh, UFO discoveries. The sand is burnt black in the shape of the craft, and it was about, um, I believe it was 15 meters long. Now, if that isn't, I mean, how do you burn sand black? By the way, I have an answer to that. Um, uh, an American physicist uh, named W.C. Levengood uh, tested the sand for the show sightings, and he explained uh, that it was a low-melting hydrocarbon. It actually melted when they put the camera lights on it, and he said he was astounded. He's never seen material like this. And it was a, a, a pretty uh, big breakthrough on the sighting show. But nonetheless, what was astounding more is the area that wasn't burnt, the vegetation that wasn't burnt by whatever put this black stuff on the, on the sand. In the right-hand corner was a three-foot pilot whatever, there was a dashboard, there was a seat. Apparently, they left a photo of the person driving this machine. Now, this is not a marginal story. This was front-page news in Israel. You had... Boy, we've got a lot of interference. Is that normal? It's a, it's a pretty amazing. No, no, the interference... Oh, uh, oh, I, I'm I'm sorry, Barry. I I didn't I didn't hear anything. But please continue on. No, no. I, every every few minutes, it sounds like I'm being staticked out. Hmm. You don't hear it? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Fine. If you don't hear it, I I'm good with static. All right. Now, what you've got is a major story, and no one could predict that this would be the first. Of, of a series of uh, peculiar isn't the word for it. Now, at Shikmona Beach, there were so many people after the newspaper article came out, uh, there was an ice cream truck there. And I, use, I always use that when uh, an incident becomes very well known. Somehow an ice cream truck shows up to uh, serve the tourists. This was the first one. Now, this happened at Chicmon Beach twice more. And, again, well, if you don't hear the static, then I'm going on. This happened twice more. Six months later, June the 6th of 1988, uh, a little more than six months, um, once again, there's a man on the beach, and he sees this craft, and it's, it has a flash. The flash hits the beach, and it flies off. And he reported it, 
and there was 100 yards south of the Abi uh burnt image. There is a new burnt image, about the same. <laughs> All right. If you don't hear that static, I repeat, it's coming in big on my side. Now, then in April of 88, uh, well, two, well, they were teenage lovers. That's who they were. They were on the beach, nestled in a cove, and, uh, well, uh, and the same sort of helicopter in distress, banana shape. They saw the same sort of craft as the first two would. Uh, the first two witnesses had seen, but this time it exploded into thousands of little pieces. And what do you know, the next day, by now there's a UFO community in Haifa. They come down and they check, and there is glowing rocks in the water. Inside the water, they pick them up, and they were cold, and then they dissolved into dust. So they brought in from the Technion, a nearby community college, they brought in a professor with a magnometer, and he uh, took some of the glowing shards back to his laboratory, and what did he discover? Well, for one thing, the magnetism of the area within, within, well, we're, we're, whatever the ship was that blew up was 6,000 times higher than when he took the machine outside uh, the area. But more to the point, and this again was confirmed by the sighting show, the material in the water was magnesium. That's it. I mean, there, there was a crash in Bra outside Brazil in 1957 over the ocean, and they had the same thing, uh, that the material glowed and turned out to be magnesium. Nonetheless, that was Shikmona Beach. Now, what makes this of particular interest to certain researchers? Believe me, I, I took uh, other researchers who were not quite as conservative as sightings, if you can use that term, but if you go from the original UFO imprint, that was Ami Akrai's imprint, and you take a path up the dunes to the top, it's about 100 yards. There is a shrine in, um, no, oh my goodness, uh, not Jeremiah, oh this is terrible, who was the um, prophet who challenged the Canaanites to a, a duel um, of of the bulls. That he, yeah. Pardon me? Elijah? Elijah. That's it. Perfect. Elijah's tomb. On that spot where the, where the bull contest took place, huh. there's a shrine, a 2,400-year-old shrine. Uh, in that spot, Elijah challenged the Canaanites to a a battle of of the bulls, and they spent all. He said he could roast his bull. His god could roast a bull from the heavens, and the Canaanites accepted the challenge, and they spent all night, and nothing happened. Next night it was Elijah's turn, and he showed off, and he poured water on the bull, and uh, what do you know? God uh, put a ray of light that well made breakfast for everybody, and it. It roasted the whole bull. On this spot, there is a shrine. Uh, it's called Elijah's uh, Cave by many people, but it's, uh, well, it's human-made. It's 2,400 years. Inside, there are pictures on the wall, ancient drawings, 2,400-year-old ancient drawings. It's a major shrine in Haifa. On the wall there, I'm telling you, it's a spitting image of the UFOs that, that were burnt on Shikmona Beach. Spitting image. Now, I took, I took a German uh, researcher, uh, Michael Hesman, who's a very nice guy, but he, he's pretty, if what we're talking about, I can use the term, he believes anything. And... Uh -huh. 
that being said, he saw the he saw the craft or whatever. Nobody knows what it is that was drawn on the wall of Elijah's cave and says that's the same one. Sighting says it's probably a bat or something. They couldn't accept that. Uh, the historical significance of this, sightings cut it out, even though I took them there and they filmed it. Uh, Michael kept it in and became a prize of his. I kind of believe, um, look, Shikmona Beach has got lots of archaeological ruins, and they're around... Well, I got scientists from the Marine Institute of Haifa to explain what they should be. They call them ritual baths. Why put a ritual bath next to the ocean? There's all kinds of legitimate questions. But the fact is on Shigmona Beach, whatever happened in the years 1987-88 was extremely well documented. To the point where Shirley McLean flew to Haifa just to be on Shikmona Beach. It was a worldwide incident. Well, it wasn't a, a UFO landing like any others. It was a burning of an image, making a photograph on the sand uh, of the craft, two of them, uh, over eight months difference. There must be something, some reason Shikmona Beach was so attractive. Uh, to three separate crafts in 87, 88. Now, that's the first incident. That's incident number one. Now, I'm not going to go in chronological order. Um, um, all right. I ha You can hear me, right? Static or no static? Yes, and just so you know, Barry, um, some of the people in the chat room uh, do say that they're hearing some static every once in a while, but... I'm not hearing anything on this on this side, and so I'm hoping that the recording is is clear, and that uh, when people listen to it in the archives, it'll it'll all play. Um, all yeah. right, um, you live with what you live with. Uh, let's go on to uh, really the as good as Shikmona Beach was. Uh, the incidents that began in a place called Kadima, and they're the they're, well, they're the source of my my book. My book is called Return of the Giants, and I'll tell you how to get it later. But Kadima, on April 20th of, uh, of 1993, Sipora Carmel, um, an attractive single lady, uh, I would guess they were all the same age. They were all 38, 39, all of them. All the women involved, and you're going to hear about a lot of women right now, uh, we're all the same age. And I'm going to mention one other fact. You're about to hear about a whole pile of giant sightings, and they all happened on, on the Jewish Sabbath. All of them happened on Friday night or Saturday morning. All of them, the works. And... I, I don't begin to explain a coincidence like that. But we start with Sipora Carmel. She feels drawn, who knows, she's a very dramatic lady, uh, very, very perky. She felt drawn to go out of her house at 6.30 in the morning, or, and she sees what she thinks is a new fruit silo. And she says to herself, why would they put a fruit silo up overnight? She doesn't know what this, this metal thing is uh, in, in, in the field behind her. And then she looks uh, left. All this is happening instantaneously. She looks at the silo, then looks left, and she sees um, a seven-foot being Examining vegetation and don't even begin to try to understand why someone would uh, fly 56,000 light years to, uh, to look at weeds. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But he was examining vegetation, wearing what she called a beekeeper's hat. 
and it covered his face. And she understood what was going on for some reason. And this is one of the surprising things. The women were in some way anesthetized. They were very calm, all of them, with these creatures. The creatures spoke telepathically to them, calmed them down, and, well, they were... Well, they were a lot friendlier than the creatures. All right, see, Bart says to the creature, would you mind taking off your hat? I'd like to see your face. And it answers telepathically, no. She says, why not? She says, that's the way it is. And then he tells her to go back in your house. Um, I'm a little busy now. And she does. Now, this this story would not have made a lot of uh, fuss, except it happened to her twice more on April 28th and April 30th. By the third visitation, every uh, amateur ufologist in Israel was going to Kadima to see the circles. She probably had two circles in her backyard. All the grass was dead. Around was, you know, lots of vegetation, but where the circles were, everything was dead. Now, within the circles, there were two elements that would continue to show over and over again in Kadima and the Kadima area. One was a shiny metallic stone found inside the circles. It was later multiplied. It was tested by me at the University of Pisa, University of Birmingham. It was tested at the Israel Geological Institute and was tested uh, by uh, Professor well- uh, Levengood of the Sighting Show. All the results are the same. It was very close to pure silicon. And in 93, that was expensive to do. It was like 99.53% pure silicon. These shards were found in all the sites. There was also a red fluid. Now, I put my hands in a fresh UFO site, and my hand came back red. Something stuck on it. This is what happened to everyone. And well, first of all, uh, you know it's a little scary. You don't know, you don't know what it is. Uh, I wanted it off. That's all I can say. I wanted this stuff off my hand. You couldn't wash this stuff. I mean, it took a long time to get off your hand. Now this was tested again. Um, well, it was tested twice that I know about, but the results are the same. It was tested for Americans. Again, by Levengood on the sighting show, and it was the same as the Israeli results. What was unusual about this oil, I mean, it had the usual iron and aluminum and normal stuff, but you had a graph of, um, of, of the elements, and cadmium just went sky high. It had a, a tremendous amount of cadmium in this oil. Which, by the way, cadmium is, is not an oily element. Uh, you, you have to do stuff to it to make it into an oil. But neither here nor there. In, in event after event, silicon and, and cadmium oil. Now, the next event was not far from Seaport, uh, Shosh Yehud. Now, Shosh Yehud is uh, very different than Seaport. She is the town treasurer of Kadima, a very, very uh, professional lady, and the, couldn't be more different uh, than Sipor night and day. And they, they knew each other just a bit. The others never met, nobody met anybody else, uh, but Shosh and Sipor lived in Kadima and would bump into each other. All right. Now, Shosha's story, she's got a husband. He sleeps through it. All the husbands sleep through it. Only the wives know when the following happens. 
and it happens on a few more occasions. In Sipora's case, the giant, it's, um, it revealed his face. It's now, it's seven feet tall, it's bald, round eyes, black eyebrows, barely a nose, barely a mouth, metallic, everyone used the same terms, metallic or neon clothing, and it floated on its feet. Those are her exact words. But people said the same thing, that the feet didn't seem to be touching the floor. This is what everyone saw uh, with their masks off. Now it's and now in Sipora's case, it gave her a message, I'm not here to hurt you, and suddenly Sipora saw a very friendly figure. She didn't panic, she was glad he was there. Now all she remembers is him circling her bed and looking at her. And I think I think things were forgotten, we'll go into that shortly. Uh, but there was... There was no way out except through the wall. There was no other way out of there. Now, it went through the wall back to a ship. We know that because you had the circle. And she told a few people, and they came out to see it. And one thing led to another, and then the circle at Shoshihu's house uh, became the next cadmium oil, a silicon shards. Uh, Kadima now had itself three landing, uh, four landings, and three landing sites. And Seaport, uh, not Seaport, I was Shush, uh, really didn't want to make too much out of this. But there, well, as my investigation carried on, let's go to the next person, uh, and that is Hannah Somach. Now, Hannah Somach, lives in Burgata, two miles from Kadima. Uh, a very vibrant lady. Again, they're all 39 years old at the time. They're all white-collar uh, workers, very intelligent. Hannah um, Salmach has a story. Now, I want you to know I arrived with the sightings crew, and there were circles all over the vegetation, the lawn, the tree, inside the trees, I mean, her house was haunted, uh, that, and she's got plenty of stories. But the main one, the one, the first one, was, now, she's in her kitchen with her dog, Friday night, 3 in the morning, when suddenly the dog rises and starts flying through the air and smashes against the wall, and you know, you're there making coffee or something, your, your dog goes flying. <laughs> you, you gotta, there's got to be a reason. So she goes outside or tries to. <laughs> there's something blocking her way. She can't get outside. She puts her hands in front of It's an invisible door or something. Uh, she did her best to describe it. But there was outside checking her pickup truck. And again, why would you travel 56,000 light years to check a pickup truck? But that's what he was doing. And she sees him, and she says to him in anger, she says, what did you do to my dog? <laughs> okay, that was the first thing on her mind, and she was going to get to the bottom of this. And it answered her, the dog was bothering me, you're starting to bother me, go back to your husband. That's how he answered. These people were not interested in communicating. They were very, very gruff. He said, I can do the same thing to you. That's not a nice thing to say to someone. So, no, not at all. Why, did you lose me? No, no, I, I just said no, that's not at all a, a good thing to do at all. Um, can I ask you one question before you continue on with your story here? Yeah. Um, Barry, um, I just wanted to ask you, as far as you were mentioning that they could go through walls and um, go through walls. Obviously, it wasn't a physical presence. If right. they went through a wall, it was clearly not a physical being, whatever it was. 
Right. Well, I was going to ask you about a specific chapter in Joel, Joel chapter 2. Oh, I don't know anything about that, so what's the point? Let okay. me go on. This is not a biblical book, my book. Uh, okay. What's relevant we'll get to. I do... Uh, no, it, let the story go on, then ask me about Joel. Okay, please. Continue. All right. Now we're going... Uh, now, Hannah... Uh, has a, one heck of a story to tell, and she's got a, uh, a yard full of circles. But she adds something very new to uh, the story. She pulls out papers. She says, this happened to me 24 years ago. Uh, she would have been a teenager. She pulls out the sh papers from the local health clinic, and it says that she was pregnant. And again, she says, from who? <laughs> who made me pregnant back then? Uh, I was 16. And then three months later, the pregnancy disappeared. Now, I, I'll explain why that's important right now. That's kind of Soma's story, and there's much more. But let's leave it at that. And now we go to a major TV show. Now, in Israel, in those days, there were two TV channels. Uh, so odds were pretty good. You were half the country watching the show. Turns out it was like 80%. It was about this UFO phenomenon. And it had on the show Ami Akrai and Siporet and Shosh and, and investigators uh, who had brought this silicon and they brought grass covered with uh, cadmium. It was a major, major show. Um, they took a poll at the end, all right. Do you believe these women uh, who uh, claim to have seen giants? And, well, the audience was like 84% that they weren't lying to them. And now after the show, they left a phone number. If anyone else has a similar experience, please phone us. Two women uh, who uh, were also giant witnesses phoned. The one that interests us uh, the most, a very nice lady, 39-year-old bank teller, Batya Shimon. Her husband slept through everything. Same story, except on the first night, she, on the first night there were two of them, and they were dusting her place, she said, was a, a foul-smelling powder like sulfur. They dusted her, her shelves and her counters, and one of them saw her son's room, and in it was an aquarium. He looks at the fish, and then he excitedly waves over his buddy. They both stare at the fish, and then they float out. Now, here's the difference in this story. To begin with, this story was not Kadima. It was in a place called Rishon Sion, which had lots of other little incidents, but this was the big one as far as I'm concerned. The second thing is everyone else had a yard. She lived in the seventh floor of an apartment building. They were no longer landing and leaving a circle they they somehow beamed themselves into that apartment. The next night, she had 13 of them cr uh, crawling all over her apartment. Now, what did what did Khanna and Batya and um, Shosh, all of them were asked to make drawings of what they had seen. This was, again, for sightings. Uh, they did five episodes based on my research. Uh, so I bring them up the most, I think, because they were there five times. Now, everyone saw the same thing. They all agreed he was bald. They all agreed he was about seven feet tall. They all agreed he barely had a nose and barely had a mouth, but had big eyes. They all agreed he wore metallic clothing. And they all agreed that he floated. But did the same thing. He floated. They floated. Everyone was floating. 
Now, what makes Batya's story and interesting to me is I got a phone call from her from Los Angeles. Uh, needless to say, I met all of these women, I mean all of them, uh, in researching the book, and I was viewed as, by some anyways, as something uh, of an expert in the field, uh, by others, uh, not so. By some, yes, it doesn't matter. She phoned me from Los Angeles, and she says, you won't believe this. And I said, uh, what? She says, I'm pregnant. And I, I, I congratulated her. What the heck? Great. And she says, no, you don't understand. It's not possible. She says, there, there was no... There were no intimate relations. I cannot be pregnant. And the same story, three months later, I call her back. The pregnancy is gone. Now, what I think that the women who forgot, uh, a lot of them had very quick incidents. I I think that they were uh, molested, uh, and and they don't know it. And because I got to tell you, of these women. I'm just doing Kadima now. Uh, I mean, these women, except for Tsipurit, they rue the day that this happened to them. Rue it. They, they get occasional telepathic messages and weird pregnancies, and it's not a fun, well, except for Tsipurit. I keep saying it. I mean, she's ended up buying crystals and pyramids, and, I mean, she went full flight new wave. The other women just did not take this incident or these incidents very well. Uh, they, they, they despise what happened to them, and I don't think any of them are giving it. I caught them while they were hot uh, as the incidents happened. Uh, by now... I don't think they want to talk about it anymore. But again, you have to understand that Kadima, like Shikmona Beach, wasn't just a story told by women. It was a story with bird grass that didn't grow crops. I went back there four years later, five years later with sightings. In 93, they were in, here in 90, in 2000. My goodness. We're talking seven years. The grass was still not growing properly uh, in these circles. You could still see the outlines of the circles. I presented them with silicon. These were not minor, minor stories. There was a lot of physical evidence. And one beauty, we have a UFO video from... Uh, Oh, Ellie Cohen lived in, oh, I'd say a mile and a half from, from Kadima on a Moshav. This was in 91, before they started landing a year and a half later. He was awoken two nights in a row. His house, he said, lit up. And the third night, he, inv he invited a friend over with a video camera. And they played cards until 5.30 in the morning or so when the house lit up. Now, what Ellie did before he had the video camera, he went for the gun, and he, he thought it was a terror attack. That's what he thought. But now they took out the video, and they've got a beautiful, beautiful shot of this uh, UFO, and it's nothing earthly about it whatsoever. I mean, this this is not a plane that anyone ever identified, and you've got it for a few minutes in broad daylight. So Kadima, as far as I'm concerned, just straightforward. The Giants landed in Kadima. They only went for women. They only landed on the Sabbath. No explanation for who the Giants were, but I, I will shortly expand on who they could have been. Uh, th this uh, is not a simple topic. Uh, mostly, I do this as, from the point of view of a journalist. Um, I, I interview 
I analyze, I expose the frauds, and there were frauds, believe me. People got on this bandwagon, and there were people I did not believe, and people who were blatant frauds. I sorted that out, and I sifted it out, and the book, my book, Return of the Giants, is in fact just plain journalism. Uh, without the Giants did return to Kibima in 1993. I will state that, and I will stake my life on it. Now, we're talking to Dima with women who don't know each other. And this is important. Hana didn't know Batya, and Batya didn't know Shoshan, and Shoshan didn't know Hana. And, you, and there's another, there were another couple who didn't know each other. You even defying the most extreme possibilities of coincidence that seven women who didn't know each other would all hatch the same story and all decide to make circles on their lawn and all decide to leave silicon in this, it's impossible. These women, and all draw the same face. It's impossible. The giants... Pardon me? I was just gonna say I was just gonna say, Barry, I think that's why um your story is so important because you did um come at the angle of a investigative journalist and you did um filter out the disinformation and those that were um, you know, trying to corrupt the story and and that's why, you know, we wanted to honor your story and honor you and give you the platform to bring it out because I think this is very, very important and very relevant for uh, a lot of what's happening in the world today. And I wouldn't be so sure about that. Uh, they haven't been back since 94. Let me go on to 94. Uh, a major, major giant sighting, uh, a butte. Now, this is in the Moshav. It's called Yetzit, which luckily for me is, was only 10 miles from where I lived. Now, you had a story uh, that, well, my phone just kept ringing off the hook. Uh, another giant sighting, and, well, front page news. Ice, ice cream truck, thousands of people over two weeks went to see, uh, well, they became known as the giant tracks, Sadeha Nak. That's what they became known as. Now let's hear this story. It starts like this. Herschel Constantini, who is the town security chief. Uh, oh boy, the static is really thick now. You can hear me, right? Yes, you, you're clear to me. Wow. Um, all right. Herschel Constantini, who is the town sheriff, essentially, is at his friend Danny Ezra's house. And they're just playing cards, a uh, harmless night of, of wasting time with the, well, they described it as the feeling that a huge truck had uh, passed by the house and the whole house shook. Now, in this little village with their little gravel roads, no huge trucks go in there in the middle of a, a Sabbath at least. So Herschel opens the door to see what caused this shaking. And in front of him is a nine-foot, now he called it a robotic creature. And that may be true, and I'll explain why in two seconds. He says his face was hidden with a metallic mist. And he's doing his best to describe this because, well, you're about to see, he was absolutely right. And... Uh, a creature, a giant, was at the front door. He looked, and he slammed the door shut and told his friend Danny to look through the blinds. And now this becomes like a Three Stooges movie. Danny looks at this creature, and he, he faints. Now, what happens next is that Herschel phones the army, thinking that this was a terror attack. They don't want to listen to him. And he phones the police. They don't want to listen. And he finally phones back and says, you listen to me. I'm the security chief of your seats. I saw what I saw. We have got an incursion here. 
there's some there's something or someone here that doesn't belong here. Sent out the they finally did. Twenty minutes later, you had army trackers, and lo and behold, on the ground of your seats were not just footprints, not just blueprints. These were deep footprints. Now, we made plaster casts of them. In fact, the heel was only five centimeters in the ground. The, um, the sole was 35. Now, that means that whatever made this, first of all, was walking on tiptoes. But more to the point, uh, you see this on the sighting show. I jump up and down in the ground. I don't get a centimeter in the ground. In order to go 35 centimeters in that hard muck, the creature, well, a mathematician worked it out to having to weigh, having to have weighed one ton. Wow. Now, if this isn't enough, the tracks go on for 8.5 kilometers uh, to wow. the next village, Karen Shalom. Uh, now, that's also got some stories, but the tracks aren't always the same. There are times when they're a normal human gait, and there are times when there's a 12-foot gap between the tracks, and you can only imagine that it would have, well, if it could jump 12 feet and weigh a ton, it already uh, had unique characteristics. I would have guessed it, it floated 12 feet, but there were also tracks with a round, uh, how do we describe it? A, a round circle uh, of a, a few inches in diameter. Now, what I concluded was that it had to be a walking stick. What else could it be? Now, what happened, first of all, front page news. I went and investigated this from every angle in the book. Uh, I brought my children. One was a baby. One was stunned to be stepping into tracks about as half as tall as he was. I went around. It turns out that a family filmed the, the craft. Whatever this thing came from, the night that it happened, in a nearby house, the Sadon house, two brothers, uh, 13 and 11, had filmed the craft. Now, why did they do this is unbelievable. They take me out to the porch. It's burnt. There's a doghouse there that's burnt. It's, they said something, our dog was barking like crazy, and something out of nowhere, burnt his doghouse, not to mention the sofa and a few other things. I also have material from the sofa. It's, I think, just burnt foam rubber. But nonetheless, this doesn't happen to most people on a given night, so the kids brought out their video camera, and lo and behold, this is not as good a craft well, there were so many much better craft films in Israel uh, after this incident. The peak years were 96, 97 for unbelievable films. But this was pretty good. Whatever happened, the public actually wanted an explanation. And by the way, when I got there, there was an ice cream truck. <laughs> All right, it was a good spot. Uh, it made the papers. People want to see the tracks. Now, what uh, you have to understand is Israelis want rational explanation. They're very easy to fool. And anyone in authority says anything, they usually uh, fall head over heels. We're going to bring you peace. Oh, good. You know, they've got a really warped mentality. You don't have to defend yourself anymore. There's going to be peace. This mentality was, well, what made the tracks? Now, normally you can believe anything, 
But the police said, we haven't got a clue. And they brought in an officer of the local nature reserve authority, the one who knows everything that's going to be happening in the woods. He follows the tracks. There's a little bit of a press conference. I saw it on TV. He says these were obviously made by an antelope. <laughs> now, well, people just sat in front. They sat in front of their sets, and those in the know, and there were by then thousands of them, many thousands from the newspaper reports. If it was an antelope, it would have had to be a one-ton floating antelope holding a cane. So he backtracked, and he said, no, I was wrong. It, it was a camel. Same thing. Then it was a two-legged camel that could float 12 feet and carried a cane at its right hoof. Finally, he said, you know what? Uh, I give up. Maybe they were from outer space. Now, that was not the final this is not what convinced the Israelis that eight and a half kilometers of impossible boot tracks had to have an explanation. And here's where uh, this naivety, which is killing Israel in a thousand different ways, the police issued their final report on the seats. What caused the eight and a half kilometers of tracks was a cult. It was a strange, mysterious cult. This, of course, ignores uh, just about every piece of rationality. Listen, I want to join this cult. Then it sounds like a great cult. You get to dress. You get to dress up as a giant. You get to scare the willies out of the local sheriff. Make impossible boot tracks uh, to the next village. And be filled with a craft above the uh, above the uh, the most obvious seats. Uh, I volunteer. I'd love to be a part of this cult. That was the final police summation, and it was a joke, a first class joke. The Rockwell weather balloon and the explanation there. This was a little more extreme with Roswell. Well, why not? It, there's enough anal The analogy is good enough. They didn't even discuss uh, that there was a disc in the sky. None of that. That all disappeared. Now, this section, what I'm, um, I'm talking about right now, this is the end of the... Well, there were little incidents, and for me, this is the end of the Giants. There was never an incident with this kind of evidence um, ever again. There were reports, and I'm always very skeptical of reports, but there is no question whatsoever that giants arrived in Moshav Kadima. That is guaranteed. Too many witnesses, too many circles. They arrived. Now, trickier is Batya Shimon. She didn't save the physical evidence, so we we could dismiss her. We cannot dismiss Hannah Somach, who had a circle in her backyard and continue to have them. And as for Yitzitz and the Herzl Constantini, you had eight and a half kilometers. And we went there, by the way, let's see, they arrived in February. We We went a month after. Uh, the um, whatever it was landed, landed, and they were still solid as a rock inside this ground. That's the best evidence anyone could ever answer. And there was also a film, just like in Kadima, of the craft. This is in any court, in any real court, you bring in this kind of corroboration. And the witness testimony alone would lead to the inescapable conclusion that there were giants in Israel. We don't know why, but there were too many witnesses. You throw in the physical stuff, and it's now beyond. 
I don't care what the cynics and the skeptics say. It's beyond any possibility that there were not giants uh, in Israel in 93, primarily in the area of Kadima. But in 94, a different kind of giant. He was not a seven-foot uh, bald giant. This, Herzl insists, walked very robotically. He saw him walk away from the porch. His friend Danny Ezra took one peek, and he collapsed from shock. And by the way, when I went to Yitzit and tried to, I met Danny Ezra. He was still in shock. Now, I'm going to give a strange piece of information that Herzl gave. Um, I think it was sightings as well, although I did a show for Fox TV and Bob Kiviat. Uh, all right, I think it was uh, sightings. I won't get confused. Herzl showed, first of all, he showed me without the cameras, and I wrote it down. The night the giant landed, his gonad, one gonad, blew up to the size of a gigantic balloon. And he showed me the reports from the local uh, medical clinic that he was brought in, <coughs> excuse me, for a highly inflated gonad. And they they described that they gave him antibiotics, and by morning it was better. Nonetheless, there is some sexual side to all of this, and I don't know what it is. But in the case of Batya Shimon and Hana Soma, I assume they were implanting uh, implanting fetuses and taking them out, and just having a look how the mothers were doing. Something like that was going on, I think. But again, 93 and 94 were Israel's years uh, for the Giants, especially 93. 94, right at the end, in late December, Herzl Constantini and his incident, and that's it for the Giants. Those were the two years they have not returned since. That's a pretty, pretty amazing story, Barry, and... Uh, for the amount, like you said, for the amount of evidence and the amount of eyewitness accounting and for everybody's um, stories to have corroborated when they never met, it's, it's sheer overwhelming evidence, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you, did, have you ever heard about a sighting of, of giants also? Um, this was in October, September of 1989, and it happened in a place called Varaznia, Russia. Oh, they were sent to me, and I get these phony giant bones sent to me all the time. Uh, you, look, you have to be very, very careful of this stuff. Uh, I've read about that stuff for many, many years, and the evidence is not very good. Uh, but again, in 89, this was Russia. Well, supposedly Russia has opened up their files. Uh, this was the Soviet Union. But listen, I don't pay attention to, uh, really. Uh, when somebody goes and uh, takes the trouble to prove it, and nobody has taken the trouble to prove it, and week after week I get these phony photoshops of giant heads. Look, they found giants, and it's all a fraud. And if you want giants, you go to Israel. That that's where it was not a fraud. Now, there's also something you should know about that's very very important. There's a monument, it's 5,200 years old, that, well, it's called Gilgav Rephaim, the Circle of the Giants. Now, this thing um, is a fantastic site, uh, up there with Stonehenge. It's older than Stonehenge by a couple of hundred years. It's on the Golan Heights. Now, I'll describe it first. And uh, then we'll go backwards a bit. It's five concentric circles of loose stone. There are two entrances. Well, look, the um, astronomers have found that 5,000 years ago, Sirius would have risen from this one. And the eclipse of the sun, not eclipse, the equinox would have gone through this one. We're not sure what we're not sure why this thing was built, but we do know something. The thing is 
159 meters in di- diameter. That's one and a half football fields of 37,000 tons of of uh, uh, loose rock. The the residents of the Golan Heights 5,200 years ago were were simple nomads. They were not the builders of of Gilgal Rephaim. That required something beyond uh, the, beyond the, the sheep herders who lived up there. Now you can't see this circle unless you do it from the sky. You go up in a balloon, and which, by the way, people have done to take pictures of it, and then you see that this is no ordinary accomplishment. Now it gets it gets more. Well, there are eight. 8,400 dolmens surrounding this thing. The actual... Wow, that static's driving me nuts. The actual size of this um, Golan Heights monument is much, much larger than the uh, Pyramids of Giza. It's a much bigger area of activity than, than what went on in Giza. And it's also... And this is important. It's also 700 years older. The first pyramid was 4,500 years ago. This um, Gilgal Rephaim was built 5,200 years ago with an an addition 1,000 years later. Now, you can really hear me through this, huh? Um, I'm not hearing any static at all. All right, I'll ignore it. I think your listeners can hear it as well as I can, but I'll ignore it. Now, look, today was a um, very, um, it was surprisingly ominous today. I went to synagogue. I uh, I go every chance I can get Saturday. And this week's reading of the Torah, every week you take another chapter of the Torah and you read it. This week is uh, Deuteronomy. And Moses, well, part of Deuteronomy, the actually chapter one. Moses starts talking about how ashamed he is. Um, he rehashes the whole Exodus. That the first time uh, they reached uh, the land of Israel, he sent in scouts. And uh, this was two years after they left Egypt, and the scouts came back with a story that there were giants, that there were giant fortresses. And an alliance had been made with the giants, the Anakim. Now, that's the first portion. Later on, Moses Moses will not allow that generation to come into Israel. They're too cowardly. They're afraid of giants, and uh, they would lose. Uh, 38 years later, he's back with a new generation who can take on giants. And they start knocking off uh, city after city, some, well, uh, the big problem was the Rephaim. Those were the giants. And God, well, according to the Torah, God intervened and knocked away the, the Rephaim, the giants, in city after city. And that, well, that left only one more region. And then we defeated the Rephaim. Now, the region was the Golan Heights. Uh, it was called Bashan. But part of it, Bashan was the country that was ruled by a giant named Og. Now, the, uh, the Torah reading said that his bedstead was preserved uh, because it was 13 feet long, which means he was probably 11 feet tall. And he died. Which made life a lot easier for the for the Israelites. Uh, they took over Bashan, and uh, Moses. Well, Moses was dead. Uh, I guess it was God. Uh, the land was divided up into different tribes, and the land of the Rephaim, which is in Bashan, uh, was given to uh, the half tribe of Manasseh. In short, the land where the Gilgal Rephaim stands to this very day <clears throat> is the land of Bashan. 
And the land of Bashan was the land of the Rephaim. The peasants of of um, of the Golan Heights could never ever have committed themselves to building well loose loose stone. Uh, there's only one other. That's the one in Zimbabwe. I think there's one in Malta. It's a very very uh, engineering wise to make five concentric circles. Uh, with a cairn in the middle would have been an enormous task. To actually get it done would have required a society. And as far as we know, 5,200 years ago, there was no society building megaliths uh, in the Golan Heights. The one his, at this time I'm speculating. Uh, believe me, I've uh, spoken to many archaeologists, and they're speculating too. Um, we, in short, I think the Rephaim built this uh, monument for reasons we don't entirely understand, but I think the land of the Rephaim was called that in the Torah reading today because it was the land of the Rephaim, and they had some reason for putting up the Gilgal Rephaim and the Dolmens on the same plane. That's my that's my, well, how do we put this? I'm guessing, but there's there's some decent reasons to reach those conclusions. Uh, Barry, have you ever been to, like, uh, Baalbek and, um, like, Petra, and the, the different... I've been, to, I've been to Baalbek as an Israeli soldier uh, capturing the place. Wow. Um, well, tell us I was in the Lebanon War in 82. I was very close to Baal. It was across Lake Karun where I was. Uh, but these places aren't built by giants. Well, uh, I'm sure I could enjoy a holiday there, but there wouldn't be anything for me to research. Uh, what about like the the trillium stones or those particular? Because I've I've never seen them personally. Um, so with you as being an eyewitness, I was just going to ask what your experience was um, in, in seeing those stones because supposedly they're so large that um, we can't even quarry stones that size. Oh, now. Balabek's got a big stone, yeah. Uh, you have that as well in Jerusalem. Balabek's got uh, a stone. It's a famous stone. I've seen the picture. It's uh, uh, many... Um, uh, well, hundreds of tons. I think it's like a 200-ton stone, uh, and it's supposed to be a pillar that goes up, and uh, it was deserted uh, from for a flaw in the rock and stuff. Yeah, I know, but that Jerusalem's got an amazing stone uh, by the Western Wall uh, that is 60 tons, uh, and how do you lift without cranes and stuff? Uh, that's a mighty big rock to lift up. That's one of the mysteries, but I, I really, I really doubt. Uh, I think they had some sort of technology to do it. I don't think giants came down and made them uh, impossibly big rocks uh, to hew pillars and stones out of. Yeah, I've seen things like that. And they're legitimate mysteries. I don't think they're part of the tale, though. Um, in concluding your article, you said maybe it's a long shot, but no one has come up with a better explanation for Israel, Israel's current UFO wave. And you said that I believe the giants may be coming home. I conclude on a somber note that the biblical giants were God's enemy and Israel's and armies were the means to their utter destruction. There's a legitimate reason to contemplate the recent revival of giants in Israel with a good measure of dread. Well, yeah, I mean, that was the year. Look, that 1993 was not just the year of the giants in Israel. It was the year when Israel sold itself uh, in, some, in a so-called peace deal called the Oslo Accord. Uh, you know, it's a remarkable thing. Also, this timing, many people don't know this, uh, but Israel uh, has a very united front uh, attempting to destroy it diplomatically. Uh, 
if that doesn't work, you'll have a missile war coming up, which should do the trick. In 1993, Israel sold its dignity and its sovereignty to the PLO in something called the Oslo Accord. Now, up up to that time, the PLO were gone. They were nowhere near us. We had a few casualties, but we could live with it. Since then, it's just been uh, this slow uh, demise of Israel. In March, um, in April of, of 1993, the Oslo Accord uh, was, um, the writing had begun. Um, and I know something about this. I interviewed for political reasons uh, one of the negotiators of this god-awful so-called peace agreement. Uh, they had concluded in April, and now it was a matter of getting it in order and on paper. And by July of 1993, they had put it down on paper, and in August, uh, uh, it was announced to the world those were the months the Giants the Giants first landed in April and they last landed in July. And now again, it may be speculation, but I don't care. I think there is a direct connection that the that the Nephi Leem smelled such rotten evil. Never ever have they smelled such evil from from, from Israel as the signing of the of the creation of this Oslo Accord that they came back. Now, again, I'm on very shaky territory here. Um, I've got a lot less shaky territory to talk about. But in in this case, the Nephilim uh, were the half-breeds who fell to earth, uh, and that's why you had the flood, because these giants were... Uh, being very naughty, mostly they're mostly sexually. Uh, they were they were being well. Sodom and Gomorrah that was to wipe out giants and, and in short, the Nephilim were supposedly wiped out uh, by the flood, but that's impossible because there were giants afterwards. So you have to deal with interpretation. Believe me, the rabbis. I uh, have tried to work this one out, too. If only known as family repopulated the earth, uh, unless they were, two of them had recessive giant genes in them somehow. Uh, the only uh, explanation the rabbis give is that Aga Bashan was a stowaway on the ark, and, and they go to extreme lengths to try and make sense of this story. Because after the flood, the Rephaim arrived and the Anakim arrived, and Israel was fighting them. The last giant was um, uh, was killed in battle by by David, King David's nephew, I believe, Seth. It had six toes and six fingers, and uh, that was it. Thirty-two hundred years ago, not a peep about giants from Israel. And then in 1993, for the first time in, in millennia. They're back, they're witness, and they're up to something. And the timing with that with that damn peace accord is is a little too uncanny for me. Uh, yeah, I I write that, but I also write that I'm guessing here. Stick with my solid evidence for uh, for for my case, and realize that now there are uncanny coincidences. <laughs> that Israel decides to commit suicide while these giants arrive. Do you think that we are in the, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the second coming of the Son of Man, where they were No, I don't believe any of this. I'm not religious. Right, right. Look, I, I don't relate to any of this stuff. What I went in is as a secular journalist investigating something uh, at the most depth in English. Hands down, of a, a very, very fantastic UFO wave. Now, I'll give you another little story uh, to show you uh, just, well, just where it went. Now, this is a story that took place in 1991. Um, and needless to say, I interviewed all the people involved. 
Now, it starts with someone named Yossi ben Maos, uh in a taxi. He's driving to Beit Shan. He is being, alongside the taxi, uh, he gets about 150 yards away. He, they were being tailed by some sort of craft. And Yossi said, well, this could be some, again, in Israel, if you see something unusual, it's got to be a terrorist attack. So he says to the ca- uh, cab driver, get me to a phone in a hurry. This was in the days before cell phones. They they pull over into a parking lot, maybe some sort of strip mall. Uh, I forget, but it was a public phone. He calls the police, and he tells them, look out the window. Here's where I am. Tell me if you see something. They see the craft, and they phone the chief of police, Israel Mordechai. Nice, nice man. Mordecai led. Mordecai came immediately from his sleep, it got into a squad car, and there it was. He saw this, again, about 50 meters in diameter, about 200 meters in the air. Uh, he says it tipped from side to side until it got level, and then it would stay level, and then a little later it would tip a little bit. He described it beautifully, but he called in. Well, he it was a full alarm. The works. He called in the Air Force. He called in infantry, anti-terror groups, of course. All the security of all the kibbutzim and moshavim, everyone was on alert. And then he had a convoy behind him. They all gathered, all these forces gathered, and the, the disc started moving. And the convoy started moving. The disc went to the Jordan Valley and miraculously turned back. And I used to think it was miraculous. What I think is the Israelis couldn't go into there, uh, into Jordan. So uh, I think it was the disc reacting to the convoy, uh, and it wasn't so, so remarkable. But nonetheless, they go back. They follow, and remember, these are officers, soldiers, armed to the teeth, all following the disc. There is nothing, this is not a UFO story uh, that someone tells you he followed the disc. This is the Israeli army following a disc. This is the chief of Beit Shan police, Yitzhak Mordechai, leading the charge. Needless to say, this was front page news again in Israel. Don't think that this was a marginal story, your foes in Israel. During that period, it was one uh, blatant story after another blatant story. This time you've got a convoy of 300 officers and men, most expecting a terror attack not even knowing what the, what they're following, the UFO stops at a place called Kibbutz Ma'oz Chaim and hovers there until the sun came up. One soldier asked Mordechai if he if he could shoot it, and Mordechai said, "Why? It's not bothering us. When when they shoot at us, we'll shoot at it." And that was the only drama. Uh, but boy, I would have. Enjoyed being on that convoy. You had massive witnesses, massive witnesses. Now uh, that was the Beit Shan UFO, and needless to say, I put on film. Well, Yitzhak Mordechai, very, very nice man, very honest policeman, who against the authorities stood up and told what he saw. Uh, so I, I kind of admire him for that. Uh, Look, I'm going to take a very, very brief break to tell people how to get my book, Return of the Giants. about to ask you to do that. Please, please continue. All right. Now, to get the book, you go to www.lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U dot com. There's a search engine. You double-click books, and you write my name, C. H A M I S H. That's how you spell Chamish. C H A M I S H. And you will get to Return of the Giants along with other books. 
uh, or you could write a return of the Giants, Barry Chamish. That should do it. Now, to download the book uh, in black, no, it's five bucks. No, It's nothing. For five bucks, it's in your computer in minutes. If you want to send to your house, all right, that takes 10 days. Uh, I want to warn you, though, the color version is really expensive, real expensive. Go for the black and white version if if you can't afford 60 bucks. Uh, it's uh, a third the price. Uh, my website, which does not have a lot of UFO stuff on it, it's got some political stuff, go to www.barrychamish.com. And, well, I've got a DVD um, of the UFO, uh, Israel UFOs. And remember, a lot of this is amateurish video, but it's real. Uh, I'll send it to you if you phone me. My number is 904-315-8079, 904-315-8079. There. The plug is over. Excellent. I, I have a question as far as uh, you, you've mentioned um, about these sightings um, and the episodes that they did on your story. Yeah, that's on my DVD. I've got oh, four episodes of sighting, one of Bob Kiviat, one long sequence of amateur videos. Only one sequence um, is is really poor. That's sequence two from sightings, uh, video off video. Uh, but the rest are the rest are more than adequate. Uh, excellent. Well, you've done a a lot of work, Barry, and we definitely honor you for. Um, your integrity and for covering this story. Are there any other projects that you're working on now or uh, anything, any other books that you're writing? Well, you'll go to the website and you'll see my political work. Uh, that's what I'm best known for. Remember, I did one UFO book um, and I did it well. Uh, that's the difference. I went and researched it and this took so much time and effort, uh, but it's the true story of the UFO wave in Israel. All my other books, uh, well, the famous one in Israel is Who Murdered Yitzchak Rabin. Uh, it made number one in Israel. This is, again, uh, I was a celebrity in Israel. I had to get out uh, when, I'm not exaggerating, when you're on the hospital dead uh, from car crash strokes, uh, uh, accidents that are not accidents and they're all happening at once you know it's time to get out of there and that's what happened to me I had such uh, uh, well I was I was on the hospital bed we fibrillated three times from an accident where the police wouldn't tell my lawyer who did it uh, I, I, I wrote the book on Rabin Rabin was murdered by the current president of Israel, Shimon Peres, who is a mass murderer. And I, I told a story that, well, according to every single poll, and they've stopped taking the polls, more Israelis believe my version of the Rabin assassination than the governments. Yeah, well, governments are involved in cover-ups and always... Uh staging some terrorist events sometimes. Um, where do you see the world headed? We've got about 27 minutes, and I want to give you... Well, I've got more from this book. I mean, we're not short. Uh, all right. I, w the world's headed? Yeah, well, just what do you see happening? Where, where do you think um, the world's going? Lots of fun. Um, I, I'm delighted with this... Um, uh, with this uh, oil spill uh, that's uh, surrounding Florida now. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when I can enjoy this beautiful new environment. Um, what more could you want? Yeah, and uh, are you enjoying living in America? Um, yes, it's a relief. Um, uh, again, the one problem is the country is going broke. Uh, and as people who supported me for many years are starting to go broke, uh, it's becoming extremely difficult. 
Right, right. Yeah, these are challenging times, no doubt. Um, yeah, but it's nice. You get to frolic in the oil, and that's always nice. <laughs> well, Barry, um, in the last 26 minutes, uh, what would you like to cover? Well, I've got, again, a whole uh, a whole book, and uh, I can just, I can do the videos. Uh, I'll do a couple of the videos. Uh, now, a very, very good friend of mine, Gil Barr, a uh, young guy, uh, still in touch with him. He <laughs> was also uh, 16 when I met him, but very intelligent. And what he did uh, really was uh, remarkable. And by the way, this is all over the Internet uh, I released it to the world, and Gil gets the credit. Gil was on his balcony, 4 o'clock, November 1997. And he sees your everyday UFO, a disc. This kind of a disc has been seen uh, many times in Israel. He recognizes it. It's traveling slowly across the sky and he gets his video camera out and he takes a picture of it and he's quite excited but then something comes into the frame that had never been captured uh, before uh, and a, a, you, um, an Israeli army well we have tried to identify if this is a surveillance plane or this is a fighter plane I say it was surveillance Nonetheless, it starts following the disc. And you can see the difference between the plane with its, uh, well, with the exhaust coming out of, uh, out of the back of it, out of the wings, actually, and the back, if I recall right. Uh, you know the plane from the disc. And the disc is just playing a cat and mouse game with it, up, down, backwards, forwards. It goes far away, it comes back. What Gil captured for the first time ever was an Air Force jet engaging a UFO. And by the way, oh boy, that's static again. That also is all over YouTube. Now the other one, this is where Bob Kiviat uh, and his Fox team are very excited about this one. But again, uh, it went worldwide in Recent, not, recent, no, oh my goodness, not recent, let's see, on it, this was again 10 miles from me, um, I'll think of it in one second, the name of the town, it's not important for the time being, what is important, now I'm going to shorten a long story, because what he got on film, which again I had tested worldwide, and Kiviet had tested every which way, there are two films. The first time you have two, imagine two eggs in the sky, and both of them are cracked open, and below them there are two other eggs fr from nothing, just appear. I don't know if that's a good description, but that's what happened, and he filmed it. So he kept looking in the sky um, until... He hit the jackpot. March of 1996. I believe... Oh, I forget the dates. I I'm starting to uh, uh, forget the day. I believe it was March 96. Neither here nor there. He films a disc in the sky. It looks essentially uh, like half, half the sun in the sky. Now, what happens... Out of nowhere, to its left, another disc appears out of nowhere, but then something absolutely fantastic happens. The new disc attacks the first disc, hits it, and there is an explosion in the sky. This was the first and only film of two UFOs attacking each other, destroying each other. Now, 
people went and they went to where they guessed this explosion took place. There was no, there were no shards. There was no metal. Again, this was not a physical explosion. Who knows what kind of an explosion was? All I know is I got it on film. I had to go collecting these films. I went door to door, house to house. It wasn't a simple thing. I had to get them all to sign agreements uh, for the TV shows, but I got them. And it's on my, it's on this DVD. Uh, if you uh, order it, uh, it's on there. You can see two UFOs in some sort of a fight that ends in their mutual destruction. That's that's really really amazing. Uh, oh, it came out of I Israel. Know. Israel had a UFO wave like nobody else. Nobody else. And there were so many people filming them and so many witnesses that you got the really, really strange stuff. Uh, the, the big one, again, this is where Kiviat, actually this one I sent everywhere, including sightings, was the Kibbutz Chatzor UFO in August of 97. I believe it was 90, 96, 97. Whatever, I've got that. Boy, do I have that. In fact, Bob Kiviat has my tape, and he better return it to me because he's planning to do something very big with this. What you had in the sky over three days was, whoops, I hope this static isn't permanent. What you had in the sky was, I'm going to try and describe it. This thing wasn't just massive. There was something over the sky of Kibbutz Chatzor near the Negev Desert that we saw rows and rows of what were either windows. I guess they were vents, but we have a close-up. We have a very good video camera, uh, two different cameras, two different angles. We have got close-up of these windows. Now, again, I use the word vent. I can't believe that these are like ordinary windows. We don't know what they are. And believe me, we had all these big shots, Bruce Maccabee and this one from MUFON. And that. everyone was analyzing what this thing was in the sky. But you have to look at the eyewitnesses. The first day, there were a couple of families, uh, one family filming it. The next day, his... Uh, you have 60 people outside. Uh, same camera, it breaks down. You get a new camera to replace the old camera. By the third day, there were 200 people watching this thing. The whole kibbutz and friends, they were all watching this thing. This is not, a, this is not an incident. Again, where some obscure person saw a UFO, you've got the whole village outside. It's all on film. Uh, I've got five hours of film uh, uh, from the two cameras. We have close-ups that I don't know what they describe, but they're the best darn close-ups I've ever seen um, of a UFO. You actually see, uh, I'd say there was a dozen windows, clear-cut. Uh, I mean, they look like teeth. You don't know what they are. Uh, but that was the, the Chatzor video. Israel was producing these first uh, from video in 96, 97. That's, um, that's amazing. Uh, all of this is just uh, really, really, really amazing. Um, can you tell us, Barry, about did the Israeli government, did they just recently uh, disclose their UFO files? No. No? Look, okay, I... the Israeli Air Force is um, is never going to openly display their files. Uh, if they ever are forced to uh, by by the public, they will pick and choose what you get to see. Uh, look, don't don't. If you want the Air Force files, the closest thing you've got is my book. That's the closest. Mm -hmm. There's. Even, it's the only book on this wave. There were a lot of good Hebrew researchers uh, who I end up quoting, 
but nobody sat down and wrote the book on this wave, and this wave really should be understood. Again, it should be understood that it happened, but there is some some historical, uh, I think, I'm guessing, but again, Shikmona Beach and uh, Jeremiah's, um, oh, is he, was it Jeremiah? Yeah. It was Jeremiah's shrine, right? You were talking about Elijah? Elijah, thank you, thank you. That was Elijah's shrine and, and, and all the events at Shikmona Beach and all the photographs they took of themselves that landed on the beach, and you've got enough biblical uh, queries uh, to ask the big question, uh, did the giants return? And again, the whole Bible, uh, well, all the way till David, then you just uh, delve into corruption and destruction, but all the way till David, Israel was fighting these giants. Well, in 1993 and once in 94, for the first time in 3,000 years, uh, they're back. In in your opinion, do you think that this, they're an evil presence? Yes. I, yeah. I think they're a thoroughly rotten evil presence. I wish there were no UFOs. I wish there were no aliens. Uh, all the people that I have interviewed that I believe have had a miserable time of it uh, ever since they came into their lives. Uh, The UFOs of Israel, there may be nice ones out there, but the ones that came back to Israel in 93 and 94 were a bunch of troublemakers. But as far as we know, they didn't harm anybody. Wow. Interesting. So, so very, very interesting. Um, Barry, let's get you to give out one more time, just for the listening audience, your website details just for the the book on the giant so that they'll know again. Well, it's not on the website. I'll give you the address uh, to get it. It's at www.lulu.com. When you get there, there'll be a search box. Double click books and spell my name. C H A M I S H. Or you can do Return of the Giants Chamish. It'll come up as well. The website is www.berrychamish.com, and that's Chamish again, C H A M I S H dot com. And I have this disc uh, that I'll send to you. Um, if you're if you're a real UFO researcher, you'll like this disc a lot. Uh, if you're showing your kids an adventure film, uh, you won't. But if you want to see really rare footage, just phone me. Uh, 904-315-8079. That's 904-315-8079. And my uh, email address is uh, on the website. Okay, and just to clarify, this particular disc has the sightings episodes and all the amateur video that you collected. Yeah, and and the Kivia video as well. Wonderful. Yes, I definitely would like um, one of those discs. Send Send me your address. Yeah, Most definitely will I'll uh, contact you after the show, Barry. But uh, we do appreciate all the work that you've done and everything that you've been involved in. Um, I and ask the listening audience to please go out there and support Barry's work, all that he's doing, support, um, read the information on the Giants, because he has it documented like nobody else. And this particular wave, just from all the things he's told us, all the different, um, uh, like the different things burned into the sand and all the evidence, the footprints, all that is just, it's amazing, an amazing, amazing tale. And I hope that in this two hours that we were able to uh, justify your story and honor it and give you the platform to bring it out. Um, and I hope that the listening audience um, definitely enjoyed this, this story and this tale. And we look forward to um, speaking with you more, Barry, about anything at any time. And 
we still have about uh, 11 minutes. And so oh, like so to... while this ending, you you push the climax 11 minutes too soon. Oh, yeah, All right, no, no, you no, know no, what? Uh, you want yeah. it... Um, I mean, I could go on. I mean, this story just never ends. There are so many stories in those 13 years. But uh, if you want callers uh, in the last 11 minutes, um, I'll, I'll take them if you can get them. All right. Uh, if anybody would like to call in, the call-in number is 646-929-0937. We do appreciate you, um, you know, holding off and allowing Barry to bring forth his story. We do have about 10 minutes, uh, well, nine minutes now. So if you would like to call in and ask about anything in particular, please do. But um, I, I wanted to ask you, Barry, also, you said that there was an image that was burned into the sand that showed um, the actual driver of the vehicle. Yeah, that's Chicago Beach. What, what what was the image? I mean, um, the image was of a three foot guy sitting on a chair in front of a dashboard, and apparently his arms are um, holding a stick of or something. Uh, that didn't come out in the image. The image was where where it wasn't burnt, and the vegetation survived. There was this in the right hand corner. Of 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 the UFO. That's amazing. Oh That's amazing. hell! In that time, I took my kids. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, childhood you could describe. I took them to, into crop circles, a very very large, uh, very impressive crop circle in the middle of nowhere, uh, in the middle of a cornfield. Uh, you know, while this was going on. Um, well, what what can you say? Uh, this is what you grow up with him when you uh, grow up with me. Look, the 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 object. Uh, imagine walking through a very big field of corn, high as an elephant's eye, seven feet tall, anyways. And then you, what happens? You leave the corn, and you're in a flattened, a totally flattened area. Um, it was at a place called Tel Adashim. Now, we, I'm not going to go through all the details. We measured it. We had tape recorders. I sent my kids to look uh, for any, any physical evidence. We didn't find any. But finally, we got it photographed, and we got, uh, we got it measured, and we went back uh, to a restaurant dead tired after this long journey up to the Jezreel Valley, and and we took the measurements and we drew it, and it was very obvious to me uh, what had happened. This was, again, this was the craft drawing itself in a field of corn. It was a very big craft this time around, uh, a very big craft. Uh, it was, uh, my goodness, it was 80, 90 meters long, uh, but it was the craft with the wings, with the front, with everything. This wasn't a, well, see, how the corn got swirled, I don't have an answer for. it. But it could, well, not the exact shape of the craft. The craft left a message again. Remember, at Chicmona Beach, these were messages. They expected people to find them. In the cornfield, they didn't. It was a miracle anyone anyone stumbled upon this. But at Chicmona Beach, they expected people to see that this is an image of us. Now, why they want to leave this message, uh, well, your guess is as good as mine. Remember, my book is not that hot on theory. It's It's very lively. And it tells fascinating stories, but uh, I stay away from uh, from theory. But I didn't have to theorize with Tell Out of Shame. Once again, a craft had put its image on the face of, of Israel for reasons I don't know, but that's what it did. Well, Barry, I appreciate you, and it's 
seems like um, everybody's just fascinated with your story and these are um, but anyways we're we're gonna end the show I want to thank the listening audience for coming in and for all the people in the chat room that uh, listened and were asking questions and uh, just taking in this highly interesting and detailed accounting of uh, the very strange UFO wave that happened in Israel and Barry's very excellent uh, integrity and investigative journalism on this particular topic. Um, I am definitely going to be reading the book, Barry, and I'll give you some feedback on it. And um, I will also get one of those uh, DVDs from you. And I would love just to write me, it. send me your address. It's on the way. I will do it. And um, we'll talk to everybody next week. God bless, and see you very soon. Thank you, Barry. I'll, I'll be talking to you real soon too, and I'll send you an email within a day or so, and I'm sure you'll hear from some of the listening audience. Fantastic. Till next time. Bye. All right.